For the first 25 days of December, we're going to be doing a readathon for my newest book, Nick. We know this isn't for everyone, so if you don't want us to read you a bedtime story every night, we'll still have our regular vlogs every Tuesday. But if you do want to come along, then come on! Welcome back, guys. Today we're going to be reading Chapter 17, The Yolk Hat and the Witch. The chimney was warm and dark. Nick had trouble seeing where he was going. For a second, he swore he heard a bat. They didn't want to confirm it, so he stopped himself from mentioning it. It was quite musty in there and strong with cobwebs. The jagged brick walls were coated in soot. Nick didn't like the feeling of soot on his hands. It felt strange and dirty, and he didn't like to be dirty. Unlike most boys his age who typically didn't mind it. Most peculiar, most peculiar, most peculiar was the smell. At first it smelled smoky, exactly what Nick assumed a chimney would smell like. But the further he worked his way down the chimney, the more he could smell the sweet scent of cookies wafting up to him and boy, did they smell delicious. Emma hit the bottom, emerging from out of the hearth and out into the cabin. Goodness, she said, I would never have imagined. The sound of her delighted voice caused Nick to scale down the rest of the chimney much faster. His boots soon hit the fireplace floor where charred wood crumbled beneath him. He then ducked to avoid hitting his head on the mantle, swooping out from within the hearth, then stopped as he was taken aback. When looked upon from the outside, the cap the cabin appeared in ruins, but on the inside, a cozy home lay before them. The sitting area was warm and inviting. A sofa faced the fireplace, a patchy quilt draping off one of its armrests with a basket of knitting laid beside it. Much like the quilt, the home was adorned with a similar knit work. Nick and Emma noticed the same pattern almost everywhere they turned. The unflattering pattern was plastered on the st stack of coasters on the coffee table, on the floor mat in the kitchen the pot holders hanging from the stove's door latch, the throw pillows on the couch, and even the drapes covering the windows, which, oddly enough, were somehow no longer boarded up by slaps of rotten wood. It wasn't just a pretty home, but a nice smelling one at that. Nick basked in the scent of cookies while Emma enjoyed the smell of a warm apple strudel. They were so busy relishing in the sweetness tingling in their noses that they didn't even notice the fat lazy cat curled up in the crook of the couch with a mouse tail wiggling out from its mouth. Emma's eyes nearly rolled to the back of her head. Why does this smell so good? What's it matter? Nick leaned into her, lips smacking. I just want to eat it. All of it. No crumb to waste. Emma followed her nose along a checkered floor and into the kitchen. She popped open the stove, but nothing was there but old cobwebs. She then went on to open the cupboards, but couldn't put a face to whatever it was that was smelling so good. She did, however, find a lot of strange items in the cabinets that typically wouldn't be items one would expect to find in a kitchen. One of the cupboards Emma opened had little glass cylinders of herbs and spices, which wasn't odd in, in itself, but the cabinets that followed were quite strange and rather alarming. Emma found a jar labeled pickled eyeballs. The pupils, all different shades of color, appeared alive as they bobbled around in a thick, oozy liquid. She slammed the cabinet shut, moving on to the next. The following cupboard had shriveled bat wings, the next dehydrated toad legs, and after that were jars filled with, she read off the label and cringed, plucked gremlin teeth. Emma closed the door swiftly. She then moved on to the last cabinet. Her forehead beaded with sweat and her heart pounded with fear. And yet she couldn't stop her curiosity from getting the better of her. This cupboard had a box inside it covered in cobwebs and crawling with spiders. The box was black and edged with silver with the crest of a monster skull used as a latch to open it up. Nick too had been looking for her, the source of the delicious aroma wafting throughout the place but came up short of locating it. He did find the cat, and what a plump cat it was. It was ginormous, at least three times larger than the average domestic. It had long black fur and bright yellow eyes and a red collar so tight that it was near choking it. Most surprising was the cracker bell tinkling and jingling from its collar. Nick crept closer to the feline, who was looking suspicious and almost nervous. He had been curious about the cracker bell, but the closer he drew to the cat, the more he noticed a mouse's tail wiggling out from between its lips. Emma, Nick began nervously, I think you should come here. I'm a bit preoccupied at the moment. Emma reached into the cupboard and seized the box from inside. Cobwebs ripped and spiders scurried while she slowly drew the box toward her. She read off the label, The Screams of Petrified Children. Emma shoved the box back inside and slammed the cabinet shut. Nick, I think it's time to leave. But Nick was preoccupied himself. Nice kitty, he made his eyes with the cat and stole a step closer. If that happens to be my friend in your mouth, I do ask you politely to let him go. 
The cat gritted his teeth, craned his neck, then shook his big black fluffy head. I'm afraid I'll have to insist, the cat attempted to hiss, but couldn't be bothered to open his mouth to do so, and so his hiss gargled in his throat instead. Come on, I'll give you a warm saucer of milk instead, Nick slowly reached for the mouse tail squirming out of the cat's mouth. Here, kitty kitty kitty, Emma hurried into the sitting area. Nick, she grabbed his arm and gave him a yank. We have to get out of here. I think this cabin might belong to a... The wiggling mouse tail caught her attention. Is that Gilbert? All of a sudden, the fireplace burst alive with black flames. The front door swung open, and an ugly old witch came hobbling into the cottage. She was short and stocky, with stubby legs and a withered face blemished with warts and boils. She was taking off her long pointy hat when she noticed Emma... Nick and Emma huddled around her sofa. Oh good, company. The witch drew off her black cloak and hung it up on a coat rack, leaving her hat along with it. She then kicked off her pointy heels and stored them away into her broom closet. She was closing the closet door when she noticed her cat perched on the couch and with such a guilty look on his face. Bad kitty, Bartholomew. She drew a wand out from her dress pocket and rose it up like a parent with a reprimanding finger. Spit it out or I'll curse you into next week. Bartholomew contemplated it, rolled his eyes, and then decided it wasn't worth the trouble. He spat the, mass, he spat the mouse out of his mouth and onto the floor while Gilbert stood drenched in saliva. No matter, grumbled the cat, furthering Nick and Emma's bewilderment. I didn't much care for the taste of him anyways. Bartholomew leapt off the couch and strutted through the sitting area. He then jumped up onto a stool by the fireplace and plopped back down again. Sorry about that, apologized the witch. Believe it or not, a yule cat can be just as difficult to domesticate as a leopard. Grumpy and lazy and with quite the nasty temperament on top of that. Bartholomew, yawn Bartholomew yawned and what a lion's roar of a yawn it was. He then plopped his massive head on top of his crossing paws. I wouldn't be so grumpy if I was only fed on time. Oh, shut up, you ingrates. You're fed plenty. The old witch heard a creak in the floorboard and turned to find the children, Gilbert included, slowly backing toward the front door. You aren't leaving already, are you? I was just about to fix us all a nice cup, cup of hot cocoa. A bad feeling was starting to make Emma's belly hurt. Normally we would love to, but I'm afraid we're in a bit of a rush as we're trying to make it to our train before it leaves tonight. Nonsense, the witch flicked her wand and instantly the children fell back into chairs that materialized by, behind them. Gilbert, however, fell into Nick's lap. The witch then gave her wand a gentle jerk, and in turn, Nick and Emma's chairs came scraping along the floor, scooting themselves into a dining room table. I just picked up a new recipe that I've been itching to try. She flounced off into the kitchen, pots and pans floating about as she went. All these years, I've been using cow's milk for my hot cocoa. Disgusting, I know, she cringed while reaching into an ice box for a carton of what looked like milk, but was a color more similar to a shade of green. She ripped the carton open with her yellow stained teeth and then poured the chunky milk into a cauldron. This recipe, however, calls for troll's milk, which will give it an extra kick of sweetness. She gave her wand another whirl and blue fire sprung to life beneath her cauldron and began to boil the troll's milk inside. Nick and Emma turned to each other, their faces pinching simultaneously while mouthing troll's milk to each other. Gilbert, on the other hand, was excited to try it. He had made his way to the table and found a spot where he eagerly waited for his cup of hot cocoa. The witch proceeded to add more ingredients into her cauldron with further flicks of her wand. Troll's milk is so hard to come by these days, she complained. You know, after their civil war and all, luckily I know an elf back in Sicily who was able to sneak me a carton. She hovered over her boiling cauldron and swept, wiped a finger along the piping milk popping with bubbles. She sampled a taste, smacked her lips, and deemed it good enough to serve. The witch spun back around, wand raised, dress flouncing. Her china cabinet popped open and four mugs came flowing out like notes dancing on a music sheet. Following the movement of her wand, the mugs dove into the cauldron, filled up with hot cocoa, and drifted over to the table. Nick snatched one in midair, and then so did Emma, but Gilbert waited until his mug landed on the table. She then climbed up, he then climbed up the tall cup, balanced himself on the rim, and then dove into the hot cocoa like he were, was diving into a hot bath. Nick had never seen a troll before. Come to think of it, before now, he didn't even know they existed. But what he never wanted to find out. 
But what he never wanted to find out was how a troll was milked. He was determined to forget all about it as he went to take a sip. He was pleasantly surprised to discover that the witch's hot cocoa was actually quite good. Mmm, he moaned happily while with a while a, he mmm he moaned happily while a milk mustache tickled his upper lip. This tastes like sugar cookies. Liking the sound of that, Emma took a sip. It tastes more like apple strudel to me. Gilbert took a slurp while splashing around in his mug. It might have only been a squeak, but what a cheerful squeak it was. It was obvious to anyone at the table that Gilbert's hot cocoa tasted to him like the best Swiss cheese he had ever had. The witch joins them at the table with her own mug of hot cocoa. Mine tastes just like pecan pie. She placed her wand down to take another sip. It's the goblin rock salt that does the trick. Just a dash will fool your taste buds into thinking you're eat enjoying your favorite foods. Goblin parents are especially known for their extra salty vegetables and it's, as it's the only way they can get their little ones to eat all their greens. She licked her milk mustache off her lips. Goblin rock salt can also do wonders for a garden, which is why once a week I sprinkle some around the cabin. It helps a lot with plant growth, but does have its downfall as it has been known to attract the occasional wanderer who couldn't help themselves from following the scent of their favorite foods, eventually showing up here. Emma interrupted. I'm sorry, but why are you being so kind to us after you caught us breaking into your home? Caught you, she echoed. I've known for weeks you'd be arriving, which is why I went all the way to Sicily. I wanted to make sure I, ha I got the troll's milk in time for your visit. Nick could feel his head spinning. You knew we would be breaking into your cabin? Of course I've known. He la her laugh was a tad frightening, and it left the children feeling uneasy. It resembled closer to a cackle than a chuckle. After all, I am a witch, and witches have been known for to foresee the future. Nick and Emma choked on their hot cocoa. Visions of times to come may present themselves to us as grand as a prophecy, other times a foresight to what we're having for dinner. Either way, it's a gift bestowed to only witches. She noticed the, children ner the children's nervous expressions. Where are my manners? My name is Bafana. I am a born witch, raised amongst my kind and well practiced in the art of magic. She seized the hilt of her wand and raised it. All the candles throughout the cabin simultaneously blew out, and then they flickered back to life with a second jerk of her wand. Do you not mistake my kindness and generosity to mean that witches are friends to children like yourselves, because that would be deeply misleading. What do you mean by that? Nick asked in a nervous chirp. Emma took that to mean the worst. She was grateful to have snuck a Cracker Bell out of Gilbert's satchel earlier that day. She reached into her pocket unnoticed from under the table, and grabbed the bell to prepare herself, just in case. Bartholomew sat up to bathe himself with a tongue bath. Go on and tell them the truth, he said between licks. Witches, like your cats, are monsters. Ex-monsters, corrected Bafana. You and I have both long since retired our wicked ways. She exchanged her wand for a sip of cocoa. Oh, yum, she smacked her lips. I just got a subtle hint of peppermint, she giddied. I'm sorry, Emma lifted her hands and flailed them about, but did you say the two of you are monsters? Back in the old days, yes, but Fauna went on to say, regrettably, Bartholomew and I were, let us say, a bit on the mischievous side. Miss mischievous, Bar Bar Miss mischievous, Bartholomew leapt off the stool and slinked toward them. He flashed his fangs, showcasing how remarkably sharp they were. In fact, Bartholomew's mouth looked closer related to a shark's mouth than it did a cat. We weren't just mischievous, we were practically demonic. He stopped only to sharpen his claws on the sofa's upholstered armrest. Bafana barked, I'll show you demonic if you don't stop scratching my couch. She whipped her wand, tiny explosions igniting beneath the yule cat. Bartholomew leapt up onto the dining room table to dodge the witch's magical spat, panting to catch his breath from the exertion. Tell them the truth then, Bartholomew purred as he rubbed up against the witch. Tell these children what the two of, you, of us were like back in our youth. Nick didn't mean to gulp so loudly. What were you two really like? We were awful, Barfun, We were awful, Bafana answered with a he voice heavy with guilt. What's there more to say other than we were monsters? Her eyes shivered while she looked out into a memory of her past. And boy, did we ever live up to the name. She couldn't bear to look at the children, and so she peered down into her mug instead. For as long as time has existed, there have always been monsters lurking in the shadows of the world. Bartholomew and I being no exception to that. 
Have you ever wondered why ugliness has always been associated with monsters? It's because a monster's strength, their power, comes from children's fears. And the more a monster feeds on fear, the more hideous they become. Bafana caught her reflection in her hot cocoa. As you can tell from my own revolting appearance, I have fed on my fair share of children's fears. The deeper she dove into her story, the more hurt she felt by her own words. I used to leave my coven every night, venture into the nearby villages, and find little unexpected children who had already fallen asleep. I would then sneak into their bedrooms, hover over their beds or cribs, and wait until they woke to find my face looking back at them in the dark. Nick took another look at Bafana's hideous complexion. Her nose was big and crooked, her face warty, eyes bloodshot, and her teeth, like Bartholomew's, sharpened down to fangs. What a terror it would be to find something so hideous lurking in your bedroom after dark. Sounds terrifying, he said after coming up short and finding anything better to say. Terrifying, yes, but for me, delicious, Bafana continued. Every scream, every tear shed, released magic into the air, fear magic, and I breathed that magic into my lungs, making me feel more powerful than I've ever felt before. For decades, I terrorized children throughout all of Italy and even traveled as far as Bulgaria. Children spoke my name only in fearful whispers, all telling the same tale of an old haggard witch who would sneak into their bedrooms in the dead of night to frighten them awake. A tear twinkled in her callous eyes. What a monster I was. Nick found himself curious to know, what made you stop scaring children? Well, I, I, she then barked at him. I just did, uh, all right? Nick shied. Sorry, I was just wondering. He noticed Bafana had grown uncomfortable. And like Mr. McTwizzle and Miss Pransley, seemed to know more than they were willing to share. Emma went on to investigate. If you're not scaring children anymore, how are you getting magic? Only by means of children's joy. Bafana ran her old wrinkled fingers along the hilt of her wand. We witches are only human. But we evolved a bit differently as we've spent many centuries practicing magic, but still human nonetheless. We aren't like elves as we're not born with magic. Our magic doesn't come from our sparks, she touched her chest, but through our wands. Thievery, Bartholomew lifted her his head to say. Witches are nothing more than imposters. Humans who have stolen magic. Oh, shut up, Bartholomew, barked Bafana. It's true, and you know it, countered the old cat. What is that cat going on about? asked Emma. I'm talking about the wand Bartholomew used his tail to whack the magical stick held in the witch's hand. Long ago, a coven of witches manufactured an instrument which we today call a wand so that they, like elves, would be instilled with magical prowess. The wand was designed with two elements, fairy wood infused with elven blood. It's why witches and elves don't get along, and the reason to which the two races have endured many conflicts throughout the years. It has been a topic of heated discussion in the magical community for centuries, because witches have never been able to articulate how they were able to obtain elven blood. Hogwash, snorted Bafana. The wand was designed by elves of ancient times as gifts to the humans who served them in wars fought long ago. Bartholomew rolled his eyes. This is where the debate lies. Elves believe that the witches of old originally stole their magic, while the witches believe elves had gifted them with it. We'll never know the truth. Curious, said Nick, thinking out loud. He couldn't help but realize that he had entered a world that he had no understanding of. There was so much he wanted to know, but didn't. Although Nick's curiosity was getting the best of him, at this time, he still couldn't help but feel magic again was the cause of yet more trouble. Emma directed her attention back to the fat black cat who was now back to being uninterested, gnawing on his meaty paw. And what about you? What about me? He scuffed. Emma pressed. What made you stop being a monster? I didn't. Not really, at least, Bartholomew answered with an indifferent attitude about the whole thing. Yule cats are vicious feline monsters who mainly lurk in the high mountains of Iceland. We're an ill-tempered species who are easily irritated, and we find enjoyment in the eating of household pets. My older brother was known for his liking for small breeds of dogs, my, sp my sister for birds, cockatiels especially, and I had a distant cousin on my mother's side who was said to have once eaten an entire horse in one sitting. The people of Iceland don't have too much to worry about seeing as how Yule cats hibernate 11 months out of the year. 
Only in December do we sneak off our mountains and journey into the villages below. Nick asked the cat, what about what made you stop hunting? I just got lazy is all. He plopped back down on the table and rested his chin on his paws again. Even just once a year, I didn't like the trek down the mountain. Too many rocks. I didn't much care for household pets either. I ate a tabby once. He shook his head with a distasteful look on his face, but I didn't much care for it. Bartholomew furthered the story of his past. My parents thought I was weak and my siblings were embarrassed by me. And on one especially cold winter's nights, they left me in a cave and never returned. I wandered Iceland, scavenging dumpsters for food when Bafana found me. She took me in, but clipped this blasted thing to my collar. He swatted at the cracker bell dangling from it. Bafana defended her reasons for it. I had long since said goodbye to my wicked ways, and so I had to be careful. I couldn't just take a stray yule cat off the street. I mean, honestly, I couldn't very well have him sneaking out of the cabin in December to terrorize the townspeople in the local villages. Even though Bartholomew assured, even though Bartholomew assured me many times that it wasn't in his nature, I still had to be wary. And so I clipped that Cracker Bell to his collar. If he tries any funny business at all, the Cracker Bell will de detonate and he'll be turned into a toad. Emma was so interested in the story that she forgot all about her hot cocoa. It was lukewarm now, but she drained her mug dry. And then she asked, So you aren't going to hurt us? Hurt you, Bafana laughed so hard she hiccuped. Heavens no, child. We don't want to hurt you. In fact, we wish to help you. Nick felt a calm of release of... Nick felt a calm of relief by this news. Help us, he asked. Of course, Bafana, Bafana smiled at the children, and what a horrid smile it was. Her yellowed, stained teeth, some crooked, others missing, had thick clumps of black tar between them. Who better to teach you how to stop a monster than a monster? Nick corrected her. You're mistaken. We aren't trying to stop a monster. We're just trying to bring our family back. Bafana met eyes with Nick, looking at him ever so gravely. My dear, sooner or later you'll come to learn that the only way to save your family is to stop the monster who took them from you. She got herself up and hobbled off into the kitchen. There is only but one way to harm a monster without the aid of the northern staff. She opened a cupboard, reaching all the way into the back. There, the liver, there her liver-spotted hands grasped hold of a long black silver box. The same one Emma had found earlier, labeled the screams of petrified children. Bafana brought the box back to the table and set it down. She, co she located the latch shaped like a monster skull and clicked it open. The inside of the box was lined with felt, and on that felt rested a dagger with a black jagged blade. This dagger's blade was forged by dwarves of ancient time. It is made of coal, a type of stone able to absorb fear which is the source of power to any monster that ever was. She stressed her coming words. Lord Avamark is no exception to that. Coal, Emma chimed up. Coal is something you burn in a fire. Questioning Bafana's words, while Bafana explains why coal is a source of weakness against evil, Nick reached into the box and curled his fingers around the dagger's hilt, then pulled it free. It was much lighter than he had expected. Oddly enough, it couldn't have weighed more than a feather. The blade itself, black and had a dull reflective quality to it like patina on a mirror, it left a ghostly reflection. Emma's forehead crinkled when she read the label again. If it's a dagger, why does a box read the screams of petrified children? What? Bafana gave the label a look. Oh that, she laughed it off. That's nothing. It's just an old recycled box from my past. She then noticed Nick's interest in the blade. With this dagger, you may put an end to Lord Avamark. Nick caught his reflection in the blade, his blue eyes, rosy cheeks, and golden hair, all stained and worn in the consequences of such a long and tiresome journey thus far. His reflection altered, and in its place was Sister Merriweather on the floor of the orphanage screaming in agony, all while Lord Avalmore tortured her with magic flaring from his hands. Nick clamped his eyes shut and then shoved the dagger back into the box. Sister Merriweather's last moments continued to sear across his mind. Thank you, Bafana, he clenched his jaw while fighting to hold back the pain and tears. But like I said, we're only trying to find our family. Take the dagger, she scooted the box into Nick's arms. Hopefully you won't need it, but if you do, you'll be grateful to have it. She did have a point, something he realized as Emma nudged him with her elbow. Emma pointing out subtly that was no harm in taking the dagger along with them so long as it remained just a precautionary, precautionary measure. 
In that case, thank you, Nick retrieved the dagger out of the box and stowed it away in Gilbert's satchel. Fauna, could we ask you a favor? asked Emma. Anything. By any chance, do you think you can use your wand to turn our friend back into a boy? She gestured to Gilbert, who had finally finished his hot, hot cocoa and now sat on his bottom, rubbing his bulging belly. I'm afraid not, Bafana was sorry to say. Your little furry friend has been touched by a curse, and the only way to revert a curse is with a heck of a lot more magic than what could be produced from a witch's wand. Nick patted Gilbert softly on the head. Sorry, buddy. It was worth a shot. Gilbert squeaked, but it sounded unlike himself. Whenever he normally squeaked, it was like he, would, he was trying to say something, but couldn't manage to. But now his squeak sounded the same as would any ordinary field mouse. Poor Gilbert had already forgotten what they were doing in the cabin, that a yule cat had tried to eat him, and that the old haggard woman, who was nice enough to make them hot cocoa, was actually a witch. There was only one thought in Gilbert's head, and that was, I wonder what Bree tastes like. It had been a question he had wondered an awful lot about, and hoped for the day he would be so lucky enough to answer it for himself. But Fauna noticed the clock on the wall. Would you look at the time? You three should be heading out if you hope to make it to your train. Emma glanced at the clock. It's already too late. Our train leaves in less than a f- and, uh, uh, It's already too late. Our train leaves in less than an hour. That certainly won't do, but Fauna got herself up with difficulty as she seemed to have bad knees, an effect caused by time spent terrorizing children in her youth. She then hobbled over to her broom closet. What was the name of the train station? What was the name of the train station? Emma shrugged. I'm afraid all we know is that the station is in Karlstad, Karlstad, Sweden. Bafana insisted. I'll need a specific name if we hope to get you three on time. Emma had an idea. She drew her magical mirror out of her pocket and flattened it across the table where Nick, Gilbert, and herself huddled around it. The map was shiny and sparkly, so alive with colorful drawings all moving freely about that it even caught the curiosity of a certain yule cat. Bartholomew perked up his head to have a look for himself. Emma pointed to the painted replicas of themselves in a cabin in the middle of Dunder Woods now labeled as Home of Bafana the Witch. That's where we are, Emma determined. But, we, but where do we need to be? At her request. A train station appeared drawn on the map in the lower bottom corner of Sweden, in a city labeled Karlstad. The doodle of a train then materialized, wheels spinning, horn whistling. Forming in the steam wafting from the train smokestack was a name, the Blitzen Express. Departing in approximately 25 minutes from Karlstad Central Railway Station. Emma cheered. There it is, she jabbed her finger at the drawing. The Blitzen Express departing from the Karlstad Central Railway Station. She joined Bafanda over to the broom closet over at the broom closet to show her what she had found. Nick snatched Gilbert from off the table and plopped him on his shoulder, then raced after Emma. Twenty five minutes, eh? Bafanda made herself giggle. No bother. You'll still have twenty four minutes left to spare. This might be a bit tricky though. Vortex travel is nasty business, you see. You might lose a limp along the way, but it's still worth the shot. Lose a limb, echoed Nick and Emma in the same fearful, fear-stricken tone of voice. Bafana ignored their concern and raised their, her wand. Karlstad Central Railway Station. She tapped the broom closet door three times to the Blitzen Express. Through all the cracks of the door came a bright, shimmering light, and it was followed by a, the blare of an engine horn. Bafana swung the door open, but the broom closet was gone. Instead, a platform laid before them, alive with many people all bustling about. Nick and Emma wandered onto the platform, awing as they watched a great silver train pulling up into the station, its wheels hissing against the metal rails while screeching to a stop. Bafana, thank you so much for ev- Nick turned back to show his gratitude for all she had done for them, but she was gone. There wasn't a cabin, nor a witch in sight, and there most certainly wasn't a fat yule cat with a mouth filled with late razor sharp teeth. All that was there was a brick wall. Hope you guys enjoyed that chapter. Come back tomorrow for chapter 18, The Blitzen Express. Oh, we're getting close. See you tomorrow.